Um, hi, Yangbo. Uh, Yangbo's also here. And hi, Saskia. Um, excellent. Looking forward to connecting these threads together mm -hmm. and excited to continue yeah. uh, the conversation. I enjoyed uh, the thread of connection uh, earlier in this week on um, the conversations with multiple folks who are currently here on the line. Hi, Jacob. Welcome. Um, so I wanted to flag, we have other folks arriving here in a minute, so I'm uh, mm -hmm. cognizant that we're just uh, getting started here. but. Uh, we can do a round of introductions here in, in five minutes, uh, four minutes. I uh, wanted to reflect for a second while folks are arriving, just uh, one thread that I wanted to pick up from what we were discussing uh, last week that connects together. And um, I think that, uh, and Jim, is your mic working now? Or are you welcome? Yeah. All right. uh, I believe so. Hold on. Can you hear, if you can hear me, give a thumbs up. I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, all good. I. Yeah, uh, and a warning, uh, my internet's been flakier even than usual here deep in the mountains of Appalachia, and so if I disappear, that's why. I just went and checked out my new office space 10 minutes up the road with 50 megabit internet, holy shit! <laughs> so uh, uh, next time, hopefully I'll have, uh, you know, have a good basis. It's pretty funny, I just got back from... Uh, Pittsburgh, where my wife and I went up to greet our brand new granddaughter, our first grandchild. Whoa. And, and just a, a, a crappy Airbnb up there had 400 megabits. Oh my God! <laughs> I uh, w welcome you to the newly digitally connected. And uh, so uh, just to thread one thread together, and then I know that Fee and uh, Jim have not met uh, e e uh, each other, and I don't think Fee and Jacob have met each other, and I don't, I don't think I think there's multiple introductions around that we'll do in a in a, in a minute, uh, and uh, so I, I'm I'm just gonna share for a second a, a couple of threads that uh, connect. So we spoke last week or last month, actually, the uh, old reality that carrier pigeons were real, and that people use it as a metaphor to say um, that. Uh, they, they use it as a metaphor to say that you know they could get it by some communications imaginable means, and I don't think that the carrier pigeon error ended for lack of pigeons either. It like just you know it's it's more that the, it was always the last resort of communication, but they found a way to communicate despite the impedance of circumstance. So I think that the way to connect that together is you know we we see uh, one field has a message for another field, how do we get the living bridge to exist between fields? You know, I think, um, have you all seen living bridges in uh, Southeast Asia? Have you seen the pictures of those? Um, they're, they're kind of amazing. Uh, I'll just do five seconds of the Google screen of living bridges. But they're, they're, mm -hmm. some of these are hundreds of years old. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the, you know, these, these are li literally, like, people use them to travel across a river. But, but what is, you know, I mean, if we say, like, the low-fidelity prototype of coordination between fields is the carrier pigeon, and the high-fidelity uh, prototype of coordination between fields is the living bridge, i.e., there's some community that stewards, you know, the creation of a new field. Like, functional medicine didn't exist X number of years ago, but when they integrated user-centered design and systems thinking into medicine, they got functional medicine. Voila, there's a living bridge. So what are all of the living bridges between fields that are missing in order for us to achieve shared intentionality? Uh, and, 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 if there's, and if it's not a living bridge that's missing, what is the low fidelity prototype equivalent, the carrier pigeon equivalent of you know, dear project management, you have failed to integrate the lessons from social entrepreneurship of consideration for all stakeholders and systemic consideration thereof. Carrier pigeon to your field. Or what is the living bridge? Maybe, maybe there's a new version of project management that needs to be instantiated as a subdiscipline or as a field. But the question is, how do all the fields talk to each other in a way that is not dystopian, but in consilience to shared aspirations? I think that would be a starting point. And with that, maybe I will hand over to uh, our newest uh, person joining to see if 
uh, Fee, you'd like to introduce yourself, and then we'll invite other colleagues to introduce themselves, and we can anybody can riff off of what I said or any of the other systems change threads that we've had in this context. But welcome, Fee. So hi, my name is Fee. Um, actually, Jim, I've been listening to your podcast, so I just find it amazing that I'm seeing you in person right now. <laughs> It's like, whoa, it's the same voice. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and so I'm an artist. I'm Singaporean, but I spent four years in London where um, I was working in theatre and film, and it sort of developed into a practice of socially engaged arts. So I was doing a lot of public interventions and participatory art in public spaces. And then end of 2017, I started an international network for socially engaged practitioners to come together and basically kind of discuss, share ideas, projects, but also brainstorm how can we gain financial independence in such socially engaged projects. And all across um, in Europe and like sort of in this international network, people who are working with communities on the ground, be it through uh, theater or arts or urban design planning faces the same, face the same problem of um, financial independence and being dependent on public funding makes it really difficult for projects to be sustainable when you want to work with communities long term. So that was kind of why I embarked on this um, sort of long research journey of searching into alternative economies and different ways of piecing things together to find find alternatives in which um, such projects can be funded and that you know people who are working with communities with mediation skills and facilitation and community building expertise will be able to actually be paid for for the work that they do and then I spent one year in France working in an NGO to understand how different parts of the social sector work but this is my sort of main research uh, question of how how we can create alternatives in which um, people can be paid to facilitate these sorts of conversations and connections within communities and, and to also facilitate projects that can be done to um, work on sustainable projects. So. Uh, Jim, uh, she mentioned your name, so let me hand over the mic to you. Okay, I'm Jim Rutt. I am a podcaster, jimruttshow.com. Check it out. Available on 152 different podcast listening applications, so you can hear it anywhere. Yeah! Uh, prior to that, I was a business dude, helped build the internet, particularly uh, various businesses that uh, either were infrastructure or application, uh, mostly the business-to-business -business layer. Uh, when I retired from that in 2001, I became a complexity scientist affiliated with the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, my deepest intellectual academic work is in the area of evolutionary computation, where we use Darwinian evolution uh, to let software write itself, essentially, through uh, crossover and mutation. I was one of the pioneers of building hybrid neural net uh, genetic algorithms, which basically evolve brain-like structures using Darwinian evolution. And uh, it was considered very bizarre in those days. It's now uh, making a return as a semi-mainstream technique. Uh, OpenAI recently wrote a couple of very good papers on it, and I'm seeing a lot uh, more interest in that. Um, I was also part of the startup team for the thing that is now known as Game B, uh, in fact, I was the one that convened the crowd. Uh, I would not say I was one of the, well, I was one of the thinkers, but I was probably not the, no, the main thinkers. Um, but I was, one, I was essentially the uh, master of ceremonies that allowed it to happen. Uh, and let's see, what else do I do? I can do all kinds of other stuff, but uh, that's probably enough for these purposes. Now, riffing on Bobby, and this is something I've talked about before here. Um, I have been long been interested, even in the early Game B days, 2013, in a broader concept, which I still call the Big Change Coalition. And I have become uh, more interested in that since about April of this year and have been talking to people at a pretty good rate. And I now have actually made some progress uh, in it. And I will probably float here for the first time in quasi-public what I think the next step is. Um, one of the things that has become clear to me is that there are many of us on missions which are more or less headed in the same direction, uh, which I call what comes next. 
you know, if we agree that the world that we live in is fucked in some fashion, in fact, I would say in at least four different uh, fashions, uh, then uh, we need, we have a duty, especially now as a new grandfather. Now I got an 85 year uh, time horizon I got to plan for, right? Uh, we have to make a civilization that will not only last 85 years, but will be wonderful for 85 years. And, uh, and there's so many other of us that are working on similar things and, I do not claim to have all the answers, or I don't even have all the questions, hell. Uh, but I've seen many other people that are on parallel trajectories. Think about uh, metamodernism, particularly the Hansi Freinach style. Uh, Team Human, Douglas Rushkoff, the work of uh, Humane Tech, Tristan Harris, and those guys. Uh, your, your pod of people in the system change world. Uh, the Game B crew, regenerative ecology, uh, guys like Daniel, Christian Wall, Joe Brewer. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer people, Michael Bowens, who I've gotten to be pretty close with. And uh, my newest discovery, a really cool guy named Tyson Yunka Porta, uh, who is a person who brings a double lens. And he brings a, an indigenous Australian lens and a complexity science lens. I've had him on my uh, podcast three episodes and his book, uh, Sand Talk is a must read for anybody interested in what comes next. So anyway, I've been talking to all these people, Zach Klein, uh, Zach Stein, a guy I met through my uh, podcast, some people from the European circling movement, and they all agree that there is something that we are all roughly headed for. So I am now thinking, this is the first time I've said this to a public group, I think, that I would like to convene a two to three day online event in early December and have people from each of these uh, tendencies and some additional ones uh, to uh, you know, present their perspectives. And then we'd also have a series of breakouts on those perspectives. Uh, now, if you heard, you know, if you, in, you know, interpolated the people I mentioned, there's one big problem white men. Most of them are white motherfucking men, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, I definitely want this uh, group to have a natural diversity. I'm not a believer in quota systems or putting the thumb on the scale, but I'm damn sure there are plenty of excellent thinkers that don't happen to be people I know that aren't white motherfucking men, right? So, uh, uh, you know, people uh, know first class thinkers that represent broad, uh, uh, broad perspectives towards what comes next and aren't white men. Let me know. Got plenty of white men. Um, well, I think it's look, let's create a, a world in which we can have collaboration from both excluded voices and voices from all demographic contexts. And I, you know, think that there's contributions to be made from. Uh, from every container because there's not just one dimension of diversity. I agree that race is an important diversity. Gender is an important diversity. There's also neurodiversity. There's also disciplinary diversity. There's also regional diversity. And, you know, I think across every dimension of diversity, it would be marvelous if cooperation can scale to the Escape the, the scale of our challenges, which Absolutely. is. Absolutely. That's, that's very well said. And as I've said on this uh, forum before, uh, but I'll repeat it because I think it's hugely important. Uh, this What Comes Next uh, Big Change Coalition should not be about us all agreeing about everything. Uh, in fact, that would be stupid because we'd be exploring a smaller part of configuration space. And from my work in complexity science, I have uh, developed what I, uh, a perspective I call epistemic modesty, which is sort of a lot of syllables to say, we don't know shit, right? Uh, and so we can experiment with systems, we can do probes, but we have to be light on our feet, and I would argue ideologically uh, only lightly committed. And so uh, when I launch this movement, it's gonna have two um, bases. One will be coherent pluralism, which is while there needs to be at least a little agreement about what comes next, we should really expect lots of pluralism in many, many, many dimensions of the search. And any attempt to coerce people into a party line should be resisted by us all. And the second is even more uh, 
radical, I think, is a concept that uh, Bruce Kunkel, one of the original Game B people, uh, came up with, which is alignment beyond agreement. Uh, where even where we disagree on what we think are fundamentals, uh, if we assume that we're all operating in good faith and with honesty and are headed towards a better world, and as long as we, there are probably some lines, we can't, I'm, I'm not going to tolerate any goddamn Nazis, I can tell you that. I'll just say, fuck them. But, uh, you know, within a pretty broad uh, spectrum, I think we should respect uh, that we're headed in good directions uh, and then honor the idea of alignment beyond agreement. And anyone doesn't want to play based on those two bases, they shouldn't play at all because they won't they won't fit. So anyway. I think there's an exciting thesis there that I want to get uh, folks to also be contextualized to. So I'd say we have both the riff that we began with as well as this uh, new uh, layer of the Big Change Coalition that I welcome feedback from across the group and dialogue here on. Let me continue around the room just so that we give each person a chance to either uh, share in terms of what they've heard or also share any context points of introduction for our new colleagues. Uh, I see that uh, we have Wilfred here. Wilfred, did you want to speak to what you've just been hearing as well as um, any way of introduction? I think that when you know we think about what uh, Jim's alluded to in terms of uh, systems change coalitions, I know that in your uh, historical context, there's been an acceleration of legal innovation and social innovation with regards to regulation and social innovation in regards to uh, how institutions uh, achieve these intentions. But I'm open to your, your own your own perspective. Yeah. Yeah, for those who don't know me, I helped uh, found and start here in The Hague a global justice accelerator. <coughs> That's still there, uh, The Hill. H-I-I-L, Hill, uh, Hague Institute for Internationalization of Law uh, Accelerator. Um, I've now been looking at how do I bring foresight into uh, these communities, because they're all stuck on AI and blockchain and their tools and their gimmicks, but then they're not thinking about uh, climate change or other things. So I've been, and the things I've been weaving together are things like uh, Humanity Solutions, Network and Semanity and Events. But also now I'm trying to think through uh, foresight policies. Um, so getting people to both predict, but then also shape policies of tomorrow. And then I'm thinking in five or 10 years, uh, I'm building a network called foresight influencers, people who are also ready to lead in a way their communities in that direction and foresight properties properties that can be linked with private uh, lands or private ventures, but also communal lands and communal ventures. And one of the groups I've been also participating in recently is this uh, Global Regenerative Community, started by David Hodgson and, and some others. Um, and it's also interesting for me because I'm trying to link justice and legal and this foresight thinking with the regenerative community I'm less familiar with. Uh, and I, I, I'm sorry, I've missed some of the crowd doing uh, meetings recently, so I'm glad to uh, reconnect. Uh, I was also, I, yeah, I was on the road, so I'm, I'm not so sure what you guys have been all up good. to in the last weeks. Yeah, it's all, it's all good, Wilfred. It's terrific to speak with you when uh, feasible and we're flexible. And what, what I would say though is that uh, a couple of threads came up there. One is that we only today have futures markets of rather dystopian futures, we don't have utopian futures that are available uh, to us as, um, you know, uh, the futures industry sells futures associated with products that would, would help make the biodiversity crisis worse. But your frame of futurism and the context of that for regulation, you know, I do want to reflect for 30 seconds just that, that when we see an apex or a nadir that can inform what's possible. One context, for example, is you saw how um, after the situation in Hong Kong changed, the uh, UK and um, invited the Hong Kong folks. Um, you know, I wonder if in a US context where some states have uh, marijuana legal and other states don't, whether the states that have marijuana legal couldn't say if any of the states that have people in prison for this drug want to send them our way, we'll accept them. If they get let out of prison, we'll, 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 we'll have one way uh, armistice in that way. In other words, uh, the, the future of law is also a, future, a futurist question of what is politically possible. 
And uh, I think that that's a really interesting place to intersect the scenario planning of the possible with the aspirational. So thank you for joining us here. Uh, Yangbo, did you want to share any context on what you've heard today so far or any words of intro for our new colleagues? Yes. So um, basically, yep, uh, Jim, actually you uh, did uh, present this uh, during segments of a school forum uh, for Plan B. But um, overall, what you uh, definitely just laid out in terms of um, diversity, uh, that's been largely an overarching theme uh, just this uh, past week uh, in terms of just for conversation. So actually with a uh, colleague Grace in the uh, Bay Area, she was about the last week we're discussing how issues such as uh, inequality and the climate, how those intersect and then also um, just even early days figuring out so and uh, thanks for mentioning Jim uh, what was would be unacceptable uh, just what would be out of bounds but also thinking what exactly like if you're trying to address such like inequalities and climate at the intersection what else may we rule as out of bounds and off the top of my mind as I say just anything that necessarily involves fixing the human population at a certain level. Well, for those who really, uh, who drew into it, the ones who proposed it, uh, they were eugenicists, actually, they really writing. Gareth Hardin, even Paul Ehrlich, he was a eugenicist, if you pay into other, other writings of limits to growth fame, all that. So it's really figuring out, so if you're trying to address one issue, how would it be equitable? So what are some, what would be the whole range of interventions or, um, paradigms that would be acceptable, for example. So thanks for, again, uh, bringing up uh, Jim right there. Yeah, very good uh, point. And this is something that even in the Game B community, there's a uh, disagreement about. Uh, and then I'll tell you the most drastic one of all, which is population. Uh, there are some people that say we can't get 10 billion people across the bridge to the other side, and that we may have to watch 8 billion of them die. Uh, I personally yeah, reject that's, that. That's dystopian. Yeah, I don't think that. I that's, reject uh, that. I reject that. I say that I whether we can do it or not. I think we have a moral duty to make it our foundation to get all 10 billion people across the bridge to a life of autonomy and dignity on the other side that's stable for at least 500 years. So I would personally. Uh, uh, put that in as a foundational pillar that we're not going to uh, accept a die-off as the way to uh, make humanity sustainable, uh, and that uh, the goal has to be uh, dignity and autonomy for all people on the other side. Uh, personally, and again, uh, uh, this is just my view, and I hope it's a consensus, don't know if it is, uh, I would reject uh, climate denial. I would not include anybody whose point of view uh, is denial of climate science. Uh, in fact, fact more broadly, I would uh, would like to exclude. Though again, there's some of these in Game B too. Uh, what I would call degenerate postmodernists who, who reject science as a uh, epistemically different way of gaining knowledge than all previous uh, ways. And while that's not to say it is the only way. It is qualitatively different than just making shit up, which has historically been the way, the main way uh, uh, humans have epistemically uh, addressed at least the bigger questions. And so, uh, so you know, so anyway, there's a number of, the, of these things that I personally at least would like to put on. But on the other hand, I would not dictate them. I would, you know, I would expect there to be a, a kind of pre-conversation about what the uh, guidelines should be, uh, but except for no fucking Nazis. Sorry, I'm not going to be involved in any group sure, that sure. involves Nazis <laughs> I, I, or, ex I, I, or explicit racists. Even though there are I, some of those that are in, in that are in the big change uh, area, you know the uh, well, proprietarians, for instance. We had, we expelled all the proprietarians from Game B, uh, which is a weird little cult in the United States, which oddly enough understands a lot of this, but adds in 
violent racism. What the fuck, right? Uh, so no goddamn <laughs> racists, period, uh, is what I would say. That's a tragic, uh, such a tragic combination. It's not yeah, all means to be mixed. Yeah. Well, so anyway, just, I, I would expect that. Our- I think you made a good point that we should have a pre-conversation about those who want to potentially hold yeah. hands and create a, a, a big chain coalition. What should be ruled out? And uh, and what are a few broad ga- ground rules that we agree to? And essentially, the coherence in coherent pluralism. Uh, yeah, uh, indeed. And uh, there's actually a movement uh, some of you may have looked this up already years ago, but they really emerged um, in response uh, really in the 2016 uh, U.S. presidential primaries. Uh, but there's one called the Rational Pluralism. In case you ever heard of that movement, I think their main office is up in uh, Minnesota. But uh, they were saying that what we stand against is emotionalism and denialism. And um, then um, also another one, also another one, and actually it represented, yeah, emotionalism, denialism. But all the third was, but uh, you're saying those, that those were just these planks of what we stand against. I want to be sensitive that we haven't included all our colleagues in this dialogue yet, so I want to uh, return to getting around the, the circle yeah. so that we can do so. And Michael, did you want to speak to what you've heard so far today or offer any words of, of intro- introduction for our new colleague? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. I'm trying. Got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm Mike Critelli. I My background is sort of diverse in the area of uh, working with mail in the postal system for 30 years at Pitney Bowes, more recently in healthcare, education, and uh, economic development. Uh, today, I had two interesting calls, uh, both of which were instructive. One, uh, really getting... Uh, understanding the micromanagement by government that un- that is prevents us from unleashing collaboration and uh, uh, systemic change uh, the uh, this morning I talked with a surgeon with a pulmonologist at a major hospital who said that the suspension of a lot of the paperwork has just accelerated the rate of innovation and collaboration. They don't, they're not waiting for FDA clinical trials. And I think we need to take a look. And I spoke to somebody uh, uh, who was very much involved in how do you change government from being a micromanagement entity to an entity that uh, basically prescribes outcomes and well, we, we have that, that that example, Michael, of the Center for New Urban Mechanics about right. that. Yes, yeah, there's exactly. this marvelous example where they took the city contracts that had been bid on by three companies and said any of a company in the region could bid on any percentage, 0.001% of any contract. They could bid on anything they could do. If they could do it better than anyone else, they could bid on that piece. And so yeah, we won that. Three thousand uh, bidders to five thousand bidders on the same contracts. Yeah, Pitney Bowes won that exact kind of award in Indianapolis uh, when they did that kind of experiment uh, back uh, when they were talking about the twenty-first century city. So I, I think that's one of the insights. How do you unleash the creative energies by changing government's role from being a really an outcome setter rather than a micromanager? The second came from the conversation that caused me to be a couple minutes late. And that was discussing how do you, un- with the, this was a provider of virtual meeting solutions. I won't name who it is, but uh, they talked about the innovation that individual customers are unleashing that they share with other customers to build an, a better product than they could have done by themselves. So this concept of user-centered innovation, uh, which then by a facilitator who is a vendor, in other words, the vendor changes from just being a a provider and creator of proprietary secret solutions to a facilitator who collects the innovations that individual customers have and then spreads them throughout a much larger network. This was- I think those are the, those are, 
wonderful context because if you can have a circular economy of roles in which producers, suppliers, distributors, consumers can all choose to volunteer, can all choose to cooperate, can all choose to create together in appropriate ways, you end up having a different kind of flywheel than we've had. Yeah, and uh, this is in fact going on with, and I'm, I'm actually dealing with it in real time, being on the board of a not-for-profit e events organization that's trying to figure out how does it reinvent itself in the virtual world. Just since March, when we started down the journey of figuring out how we were gonna go from a live event to a virtual event, we're seeing all sorts of potential for peer-to-peer -peer collaboration across the group and uh, so many other things that we weren't thinking about four months ago. This is not like we're a TED talk, which goes from a live event to where you see a speaker on stage. This is how do you reinvent the concept of virtual relationships and accelerate and energize systems change as a result. So I, those are my, I think your comment about the living bridge opened up a lot of thinking on my part. How do you, how do you eliminate the, the barriers to the living bridge? And uh, this morning, I thought I got two very good conversations on that. So thank you. Well, maybe those were two <laughs> beginnings of processes to establish living bridges. Yeah. That you <clears throat> Maybe living bridges emerge from dialogues of the right kinds. But yeah. Jacob, did you want to add context here from, from your vantage point? Sure. Um, well, I've been thinking about the concept of living bridges since you said it, because it's not a concept that I've had before. Um, and really cool physical image as well. Um, so I think uh, one thing that's been that's been uh, top of mind as you guys have been talking about living bridges. Uh, and please um, redirect me if this is not on top again. You know? But I think right now we're in a very very weird time globally, um, and it's a situation where. This is like the last few decades where you can still go to some random culture in Africa and they're not completely wired. Like they're still like getting pretty wired, but they're not completely wired. And what I'm kind of terrified by is like the ways of life of these cultures all around the world uh, are getting uh, westernized and it's becoming homogenized. We're having a cultural extinction far faster than any biological extinction. And so we're losing the ways of living without technology that were elegant and graceful and so on and so forth. In the very least, I think there needs to be documentation here and much better. Um, I want to make sure that there's always a living a seed of each of these communities that is not, not um, modernizing at such a rate such that we can retain these ways, the wisdom of these past ways of living uh, many generations down the line. And I was thinking when you said living bridges, the first thought that had come to mind was, uh, the humans in these cultures could be uh, living bridges of the old world to the technologized one. And that's the biggest danger I see with COVID is an extinction of many old ways of living because all like the cute little antique stores are going to go out of business and all these other things are going to go away is my concern. I, I think this is fascinating to think about it from <clears throat> that perspective that, you know, we have living bridges need to be their own self-determination that they want to be a bridge because they're alive it's their agency to be the bridge not just a plant level agency but a human level agency but the metaphor can remain intact if we think about all of the places that need to be cohesively transversible from one field to another from one rich part of history, uh, stewardship mm. of, a, of wisdom to uh, modernity, stewardship of a bridge from the past to the present, stewardship of a bridge from the present to the future. Uh, Saskia, did you want to add context to, I know you haven't met Fia and, and want, didn't want to uh, skip your, your, your chance to, to offer context in the conversation per, per your own sense making. Thanks, Bobby. And hi, Fia. Thank you for joining us. It's really nice to um, to see you here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just very quickly. I'm Saskia. I run uh, Metraction, which is uh, the not-for-profit partner in crowd doing, which is uh, the main reason I'm here. I also um, uh, run responsible management for a large tourism operator here in New Zealand. 
And uh, just reacting to what Jacob, what you were just saying in regards to the cultural extinction um, being faster than biodiversity, I'm not, um, I, I don't know about the speed of things, but what I can see here in New Zealand is that actually there is a, a much bigger resurgence of old culture uh, than there ever was. There's a lot more interest in it. Uh, and I've seen that happening over the last sort of two years, but especially now with the pandemic and when we have a chance to rethink uh, what the culture or what the nation will look like uh, when we come out of this, there is a lot of focus on what were the old ways, what is the indigenous, what were the indigenous ways of, uh, of operating, definitely in regards to the language here, um, there is, um, there's a lot of interest in it to re-establish what, what, what unique look like. So that might give you a little bit of hope that maybe there is already also a wave happening in regards to uh, keeping old cultures. <laughs> Actually, as you say that, um, one of my friends who's a very good hacker is working on, he lives in New Zealand. Um, he, he's working on a project that has something to do with Maori ancestry and New Zealand native ancestry. and documenting all this. And so if you need someone who's a great computer scientist who has interest in this space uh, and you need to build, I might have a resource for you. Nice. Sounds good. I, I think that ancient uh, w wisdom is important to connect to modernity. I also think it's true that we're not just talking about ancient rituals that modern cultures live. I think that we're all, when, you know, the when we talk about the, uh, medicinal foods and herbs for stress, sleep, and anxiety, a crowd doing context, you know, there's thousands of years of history before writing in which humans, scientists of evidence, were doing food forest gardening, were improving the diversity of uh, food crops. They did a study of um, on our, our friend uh, who's been on this group before, Dave Witzel's uh, re re regenerative agriculture sector accelerator designers of paradise podcast they had this amazing statistic of 2000 percent greater diversity of edible fruits per hectare than would have happened without human um, uh, jungle farming or uh, rainforest gardening uh, in uh, one study that they did so in, in other words there's this history of what are all the superpowers that are embedded into our biology because of ancient traditions that are still true today? I think the same thing is true of nature exposure, that that's hardwired in through cultures of history, historical times when people got enough nature dose to embed that into our biology. So you, you could say, what are the traditions that we remember? What are the traditions that we are hardwired to be able to reclaim, where is it an act of uh, self-care to rewire uh, the world to be able to achieve those intentionalities? Um, Carl, you've been patient. Uh, did you want to offer any commentary on what you've, what, what threads we've had today so far? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. This has been one of the more interesting calls. I like the living bridge uh, imagery. And as I've been listening to people, just a couple of threads have come up. Um, Wilfred made mention of uh, sort of the need to emphasize what's really important, not to get distracted by technology. Uh, then when Jim was talking about uh, the important or the contribution that technology can make, um, so that was one little contrast. Uh, another thing Jim said was uh, he, he, he wanted to have this big bridge to carry lots of people but enforce some views on what type of people or what kind of views would be able to use the bridge, if you will. And I, I think, you know, and then Fee opened up by talking about Gee, how do you, how do you uh, create support for artistic endeavors, things that aren't necessarily commercially uh, self-sustaining, but but are important overall? So it's a swirl of things I'm I'm just sort of 
thinking about, but I guess the overall point would be um, the Living Bridges idea is a compelling one. Uh, we, we should, that, that they're likely to form with variation in different types of communities. And we may not necessarily agree with how a particular bridge is working, but um, that, that's because there's variation in how humans are and, and how susceptible they are to, to the influence of, of others for good or bad. And that's something that's explored in the arts. Um, so it, it's a non-utopian embrace of, of, of the living bridges idea and uh, maybe the another idea that Jim was basically referring to was vibrancy. You know what what cultures need is some form of optimism and exploration. And and uh, Michael is referring to uh, how the speed with which innovation was being explored in different uh, uh, medical areas was accelerating because of the diminished paperwork, um, which is what you'd expect a centralized control type of, of uh, organization to be enforcing. You know, we, we need to, to make sure we're doing the right things and doing it the right way. So it's a hodgepodge of, of uh, different elements right now. It's a, it's a stew of ideas. Well, it sounds actually like it's uh, becoming an appetizing mimetic stew, but let me see without having the metaphor police called on myself, which is uh, what my family used to say when I, my metaphors got out of hand. Uh, Thea, did you want to offer any uh, resonance from dimensions of what you've you've heard? Yes, yeah, so I wanted to bring out a point. Um, so from what I, what I know of Native communities, it's the culture, it's the way of being, it's the way that they live which in essence you know it's it's about knowing how to share knowing how to care knowing how to be in symbiosis with nature and and that's i think that's sort of in contrast with this consumerist capitalist way of like okay it's all me 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 and the individualistic mindset and i feel like if if we want to progress to some form of change in society it requires a change in this mindset as well and how how can we bring about this culture of the, the sort of culture of sharing and caring, not just sharing and caring with within humans, but also with nature that native communities have. How, how do we bring that into the mainstream sort of contextual mainstream mainstream conversations? And I guess also like my my experience is working with communities. It's, you know, the first thing you do when you work with communities is you open up, you, you open up a space that is safe, that is vulnerable, and then you, you share and it creates this sort of genuine human connection with so many other people in that same space and then you learn to give and you learn to share and I feel like we need some form of you know this level of personal transformation in society to be able to get to where we want to get to in terms of systemic change because we look at systemic change ultimately it's made up of individuals and how can we sort of reshape this narrative or 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 change this culture that's that's what I have in mind. Well, yeah, see, I mean, you're really uh, inspiring me. I mean, I haven't done this exercise since I was in seventh grade English class, but I was sitting in, I'm staying at my uncle's unused house in Santa Cruz right now. I just sitting there, I was like, you know, if I had to construct a utopian society, this is like a prompt I was given in seventh grade honors English class or whatever. And they, uh, they just like design your own utopian society. And that was a really, good prompt for me. I'm like looking outside and I was looking at my fenced off neighbors and I'm like, what the heck? I don't know a single neighbor here. And like there's no sense of community. And COVID aside, like there's this much bigger problem going on. <laughs> and I didn't know any of them before this this uh issue. And um yeah it, when, when I start to think from the perspective of man, you know what, let me design a, as as creatively as I possibly can. Let me design a, a utopian society then I start to hit the limits of my own creativity and realize, oh my God, I don't even know enough to, be, to invent a fantasy here that I want. And that is terrifying to me. I can't even fantasize well enough because I'm so deprived in my stimuli for this. And like the closest example I could give is my mom was in the US Peace Corps in Tanzania. And um, I went and visited her, it's like 2014-ish. 
and I was in the village, and there's like no homelessness in the village. And, like people are always like being super nice to each other. And I was like, that's my biggest data point. And I had like all of a month of living there as my data, as my exposure to it. So anyway, Fee, um, I really like what you just said about um, about uh, um, it, it's the set, it, building that sense of community and so on and so forth. It's like, you know, if we were to just fantasize, look, look, I, I think we should at some point, by the way, if anyone's down to have a brainstorm session with this group, let's just fantasize about different utopian societies. And some of them will look like Brave New World, probably, and some of them will look like, you know, uh, African tribes and so on and so forth. And we'll have to figure out like all the parameters. And then I'll have a sense of uh, maybe more creativity, or maybe we'll collectively have, have a sense of how little we know about actual good living. <laughs> Um, Thea, did, did you, since he was making this in reference to, to your comment, did you want to comment on that? And then I'm also happy to jump off of the other parts of that. So I, I've uh, researched into utopian communities, eco-villages and stuff for quite a while now, and it's, it's really difficult. And, and I've seen so many models that tried with this, you know, utopic idea that this is going to work and then they, they just started something in the middle of nowhere and then in the end it fall apart because it's, it's really difficult to, I guess, to have a community and, and to be able to really negotiate, so this is the amount of work that each of us is going to put in to make sure that this is going to work. And, and you know, in, in the end, if there isn't a balance in that sort of um, input that people are giving into maintaining a space for, I don't know, in terms of uh, farming, etc., it's really difficult. And, and if we think about community, in the essence, it's based upon relationships, person-to-person -person relationship. And just think about relationships that we have with parents, with siblings, or, or with lovers. It's, it's difficult. It's, it takes a lot of time and effort. And this is community work. Like, community work takes time. And it takes a lot of effort on each part to maintain that sort of network where everyone feels safe and comfortable. And I feel like we, we don't live in a society in which there is that time or, or even necessarily the commitment for people to be able to do that and if we look at societies traditionally i mean before globalization i i, I mean speaking from asian culture families are really close-knitted like my family i'm not even just talking about my close family extended family you know there is still connections and people meet and there is some sort of support network and that that family system is strong and probably in many other cultures as well but then now with um, the way that we live in cities the way that globalization is there is this sense of like disconnect but then when when you move and and with that mobilization when you move to a new city what kind of community do you go into and, and that was my struggle when i was in london like it's so difficult to form a community people come and go all the time and i feel like with this sort of the way that we are living in modern world how how can we rethink or rebuild community and i think in there is also understanding that to, to belong to a community to have a community you have to put in the effort to actually build it and maintain it as well uh, I want to reflect that I saw a, a reference that uh, Wilfred shared to a uh, utopia dystopian exercise. I also shared one in the chat. There's um, another reference, you know, John Smart's uh, community there that uh, he's affiliated with. They read 50,000 works of science fiction and then labeled them by degree of utopian dystopian um, innovation example within it and then reviewed for export to fact the more utopian social innovations or creative innovations that were in that but that's treating the imagination as a fractal to be mined I think the imagination as a fractal to be lived is way more interesting because utopianization is in the present if we create a context where we can each uh, identify every dimension of utopianization that is feasible as a hyper-practical hypothesis. But Wolfred, did you want to share the, the context of the, the reference you, you shared there? Yeah, just uh, I just wanted to send it, like we organized some retreat events occasionally and uh, that was uh, the first Samanity was in a monastery for three days and it was also thinking about utopia, dystopia, but with people from around the world and then you end up with uh, bits and pieces of dystopian fears and utopian. If you go to humanitysolutions.net, I think in one of the top menus, um, the second or the third uh, row, there is there is some of the outcomes of that, and I can so also send a report of more. Um, oh, I'd love to see that if you share in the in the LinkedIn thread with the uh, the rest of us. I think that uh, happy to learn more of it. I think you know the the yeah. history of dystopian utopian thought is 
why I got interested in solar punk because it's you know also a genre of hyper realistic near term you know utopian intentionality in that sense. But yeah. uh, oh, go ahead, sorry. What what I find a bit interesting and maybe because you're based in the yeah I think you're closer to them. Um, I also wrote to the makers of Civilization, for example. There's these computer games that are about building civilizations. You mean you wrote and to Sid Meier? He, I tried to. I tried to reach him, but I couldn't. And then I tried to connect to some people working in, in the, the company. Because, I mean, they have a huge group of people fascinated by uh, growing civilizations as a game. But I, I, I really think uh, there's a few games... And, and civilization is, I think, the most important one that have the potential to, yeah, to 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 take it one step further and to become uh, civilization shapers. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Although I will say the advertisements for civilization have tended to be about how to wreck society and civilization rather than about the utopian aspects. But I grew up playing civilization. I agree strongly with you. I tried to reach out to both civilization creators and SimCity creators. Uh, about yeah. seven years ago, six years ago, on the idea of real-world games with real-world problems and real-world social innovations to address them. Yeah. I still think that I, I did have a nice conversation with Will Wright, but I think that the the SimCity founder. But I think that the context is not just that it's uh, imaginable, but that it's difficult because all the game designers start to run up against the constraints of oh, do we just take the most recent. Um, think tank work from a major think tank and extrapolate that into the game. Well, those are actually not very utopian or dystopian. Those are like uh, Giacometti of emaciated level of narrowness in terms of what's the, the scope of what their imagination is. If you look at sort of the, the, the most institutional sources of authority. So I think the idea would be how do you create a interface for people that has as much breadth as the imaginative communities upon which all of us on this call are drawing for our wellsprings of imagination. But we give that to everybody as a Lego set to build their own pathway to more utopian feasibility in their own context and in their, their dimension of the world. I would love if every kid got a simulation of their region when they're you know a kid and at every point in time as they come up with better theories of you know what would be the most inspirational way we could do this or that where, where where that arrives in their context right where where we have a a pull from imagination to feasibility of process and where that's where 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 there is a where where, where the brechtian wall between theater and stage and audience and uh characters is breached through our collective agency of imagination of what could be feasible and the realistic way to get there uh, Michael, did you have any feedback on this notion that if we could make it simulatable, how to get to a better world, it might be more accessible? Uh, I might be on mute. Um, Sas oh, go Got ahead. it. Got it. Sorry about that. Um, I, you know, my son used to play with uh, SimCity, and uh, so I became very interested in simulation exercises. I think they work very well uh, uh, in small communities, and particularly in the context of uh, specific crises. We, uh, we actually did that in a, a post-9-11 situation. Uh, you know, sort of as an after event simulation to figure out not just the, uh, you know, how would we prevent uh, or deal with the effects of terrorism, but how would we get uh, healthcare providers and how would we uh, work on, uh, you know, uh, pandemics and our power outages. So it, it, it works best. And uh, I mean, it's a little bit, I mean, my life experience, and I, I would defer to the rest of the group because it sounds like there's a lot of wisdom here. Where it's worked best for me is where people have a specific uh, disuniting or catastrophic event. 
again, which is fresh in their minds and where you bring people, you bring all the stakeholders together and you start to think based on what's just happened here, how could we make this better going forward? What, what could we do? And then you, you can expand beyond prevention and containment and uh, dealing with the event of the past to a broader subject of, but, but it always gets anchored as something, uh, I found it most effective when it's anchored in something concrete. And then you build out from there to some of the other Does ideas. Does it have to be anchoring in a fear of what goes wrong or could it be anchoring in a hope of what could go right if we uh, get the right approach? Uh, either one, as long as whatever is it's anchored in is very concrete and in immediate memory. I was talking today to uh, somebody whom I asked the question, uh, you know, do you think COVID-19 is going to be a wellspring for a completely redesigned healthcare and health manage and health promotion system? And he said, yes, if it stays long enough and it hits more people hard enough, then we can have a national dialogue which changes our, our vocabulary about health. And then the question is, can it change our vocabulary about education, work, social relationships? Um, we, we are, uh, uh, we, in America, we may unfortunately lack we, we have a bad habit, I think, of wanting to forget about things that are no longer in the media. I think uh, one of the advantages is that we shuck off the past faster. One of the disadvantages is we shuck off the past faster. And somehow we have to grab what's concrete, whether it's good concrete or bad concrete, and work with that. I, I align and I honor that. So the... The good concrete is the hyper-practical, hyper-realistic, near-term, hyper-optimistic, aspirational feasibility, feasible in cahoots and not in isolation. And Yeah, something that just happened where people say, you know, if we did X, you know, for a long time it was the inspiration from the moon landing, which unfortunately didn't last too long even in NASA, but it, it made people... You know, people said, if we can do X, if we just did X, what can we learn from it? I yeah, think we, we may need to upgrade our metaphor from the moonshot to something more appropriate because yeah, the moonshot be may more not immediate. have gotten the systems change done yeah. in that way. But so I want to be cognizant that we're um, uh, two minutes away from end time. We can overflow by four or five minutes as we adjourn. But I just want to get everyone a last chance to offer a comment before we wrap up for today. Uh, Yangbo, any last commentary before? Oh, sorry, someone started to say something. Oh, I just want to say, uh, is there an issue tracker for society anywhere that's like, unlike the news media, it just like posts all the open issues and they stay there on top until they're resolved? Uh, at the micro level, C click fix, yes. But at the macro level, uh, you could say that uh, Avaz pretends that it's the metaphor for that, like their million petitions are the issues. But I wouldn't say that all of them are equally issues in the same kind of way you're meaning. Oh. Yes, the framework yeah. would count as that as well. Go ahead. Saskia, you're about to finish something, so go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that from a macro, macro level, the SDG framework and the way that they track against stats is also a, an overview of issues and you know, how are we doing against those? Uh, I agree. The Sustainable Development Goals is a global issue tracking system, you could say, Jacob. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And just to have probably a good note to um, wrap up on is that what they did really manage to do, and there's some conversations with uh, several of my collaborators this week, is create something that was very on the surface attractive and such of course even though as many of you are aware there are various deficiencies on a number of fronts with those but at least to your credit it's a case of well you, of course you definitely need a lot of the substance and then how would you even bridge so both the substantive side and this is even on the thread on linkedin thread uh, earlier actually months ago by now with uh raj and a few others about actually getting things across to a much wider audience instead of even 
keeping things within this honestly, a bit ironically, silo of systems thinkers. I agree that the systems thinkers can't remain isolated from all the systems we're seeking to change. Let's change the systems. Uh, just going to go for last quick uh, words before adjourning. Uh, any last words, Fia, from your side before we adjourn? I'm just wondering if these uh, meetup sessions, there is like a specific theme for each. Every two weeks we meet, but we have systems change as the overall theme of the whole series. But uh, we get influenced by the people who join when they join, like yourself today. Your introduction influenced the direction of the broader conversation, too. Okay, cool. Thank you. Absolutely. And it's terrific to collaborate and uh, have, it, have yourself in dialogue here today. And uh, thank you, Fia, for sharing your perspective. And Michael, any last words before we adjourn for today? Uh, no. No. Um, Wilfred, any last words before we adjourn for today? No, I mean, I, I like what Michael said, that we need a concrete uh, starting point. And the, 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 the point that I'm looking at or trying to find is this, uh, I, I'm looking at real estate or a piece of land or a region that is a, that can be a playground. Um, so that's a concrete thing I'm, I'm looking at. And anyone who has ideas around that, let me know. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's the place-based transformation ecosystem that uh, Steve Waddell has at SDG Transformation Lab. There's the place-based transformation ecosystem that Carl Palmer has in uh, their network of place-based regional transformations. Uh, there are some examples like that in modern networks. There, there's also network, networks uh, historically, like you can look at Mondragon and Basque region. There's a lot of uh, writing about that, Wilfred. If you have you seen that literature? No, not yet. Uh, no, maybe. Uh, yeah, Mondragon. Yeah. Uh, here, so ba basically, the the largest cooperative in the world has um, Mondragon um, has been in Basque region and has transformed it over decades. Uh, Carl, okay. any words before we adjourn here? Carl. Yeah, I, I, this has been a good call. Um, I, I think the. Michael made some good comments about what qualities make for a cohesive group. Um, I'm cautious about the scalability of, of groups into utopian type platforms uh, for, for no other reason that uh, humans have shown repeatedly as, as, as you have more diversity inside of a group, there's a desire for groups to subdivide just to be different from, from, from the rest. So the natural bridges idea, I think, uh, you know, is, is, is a good one and the future is going to be in making it work in small groups and other groups will start to imitate it because it, if it shows that it has some advantage. But I honor to that. Try to to try to compel it on, on, on groups or expect that as you grow it, uh, the dynamics don't uh, change in a way that is disruptive, I think is foolhardy. I, I think there are challenges, but I, uh, I concur. Uh, it's also true that it's better to have, um, in the context of such challenges, um, people in dialogue who collectively have parallax against all such challenges, which is the diversity uh, that, uh, of perspective that I, I love gathering with. And uh, we're going to wrap up momentarily, but any last words from Jacob and then Saskia before we adjourn? Jacob, is, uh, before we leave off for today. Um, well, uh, if anybody uh, wants to add to my very rough scribblings of notes, uh, I posted links at the top of the chat. Uh, no pressure to do that, but there are my email. But there they are. Oh, terrific! Thank you so much, Jacob, for that. Uh, Saskia, did you want to add any closing words? Um, I just wanted to say I got really inspired uh, with the uh, conversation around using civilization or simulation games to actually give people some sort of certainty about what could happen. And one of one of the big challenges that we currently have 
or that I'm in real time dealing with in regards to resetting uh, industry or economy and that sort of thing is that people want to go back to what it was, not because that was so good, but just that was the only thing they knew. And they rather go to something that they know than something that they don't. So if you threw simulation games, you could actually sort of go, this is what it could look like. Here, you've got your avatar, play with it. You know, here's your house, here's what it could look like if you were walking around under the trees and that sort of thing. I think that- Yeah, make the solar punk world more imaginable than the regular world yeah. by getting yeah. the VR to be a higher fidelity simulation. I, I yeah. love that intention. And I I'm very open to making that feasible in cahoots with y'all and others to have that happen. I think that's well worth happening. So maybe that's a good place to close. Thank you all so much for collaboratively being in dialogue on this imaginative and aspirational and hyper-realistic near-term optimistic systems change dialogue. I hope you all have a phenomenal Friday. Take care.